You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. Time for a history lesson. I'm super excited. I am too. <laughs> and uh, it's a, a, a unique occasion, February 16th. We're going to talk about what that means in just a moment. Thanks to Concordia University, Wisconsin for supporting The Coffee Hour. Find out more about Concordia University, Wisconsin at cuw.edu. Live uncommon. So February 16th is the church's commemoration of the birth of Philip Melanchthon. Mm-hmm. Uh, to help us learn more about that, Dr. Cameron McKenzie, he's the Forrest E. and Francis H. Ellis Professor of Historical Theology at Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Dr. McKenzie, welcome back to the Coffee Hour. I'm great to be here. Looking forward to the uh, time we get to talk about Melanchthon. So today we commemorate uh, the birth of Philip Melanchthon. Who is (laughs) Philip Melanchthon? Philip Melanchthon is really a co-founder of the Lutheran Church. I don't think there was any risk that we were going to be called Melanchthonian, but <laughs> but he was Luther's uh, right-hand man in effecting uh, the Reformation, Wittenberg, Sa- Saxony, German lands, and even beyond the borders of Germany. So very, very important number two fellow in the Lutheran Reformation. Yeah, we hear a lot about him uh, when we talk about the Reformation and the Reformers. Uh, his name comes up quite a bit. So uh, let's let's go back to the beginning. What do we know about who he was, about his early life, where he came from? Yeah, he actually has uh, kind of an interesting background. I don't know how much his family prepared him to be a Reformer, but he was born to the family of uh, George and Barbara uh, Schwartz Ert. George was the armorer for the Elector Palatine of the Rhine. It was one of the important uh, parts of the German Empire at the time. And of course, our armor was of critical importance when you were uh, fighting a battle, and it seems like uh, they were always fighting one battle or another. George developed this skill at being able to make uh, very good, lightweight, effective armor and had a very successful career in that role for uh, his ruler as well as for others. And he married well. Barbara was the uh, daughter of a mayor in a little city named Breton, but her family included one of the great intellectuals of the day, a fellow by the name of Johannes Reuchlin, who had a lot of influence on Melanchthon. So uh, Melanchthon was born into a successful family that had Uh, some degree of context among important people in that part of the world. They were pious, they were religious, so he was brought up to be a good, faithful, late medieval Christian, and they made a point of making sure he got a good education. So his family start uh, was really an important thing for him. So he had a good education. What else do we know about his his childhood, his education, his early years? Well, he lived in a little town called Breton, but that was uh, just south of Heidelberg, which was uh, uh, a more important city, a university town, also politically important. And that's really where his father had his armor business. He went to school originally in Breton, and it was what they called a Latin school. Latin was still the language of the educated. So as soon as you could start learning Latin, you did. And so he did. And then actually his father and his grandfather died when he was, let's see, I think 10 or 11 years old. And his family then shipped him off to another school with a very good teacher. This was at a place called Forzheim. And that too was in the same neck of the woods. And that's kind of Southwest Germany. And so all the way through, he excelled at learning He had good teachers. They introduced him not only to the best of late medieval learning, but he was also uh, educated by those committed to the new learning of the day, something that today we call humanism. I hate to use that term because it confuses people. It has nothing to do with modern humanism, which is really a philosophy, philosophy of life that puts man at the center. It really refers to Renaissance culture And this was a movement to get back to the sources of Western civilization in Greek uh, and Latin language and literature. So if you were exposed to humanist education, you read not only the late medieval scholastic theologians like Thomas Aquinas, but you actually went back and you read Cicero and Virgil and Aristotle and Plato. 
And then because you were a Christian, you also were exposed to the sources of Christian civilization, namely the Bible, especially the New Testament in Greek, and then also the early church fathers. So that kind of education that Langton experienced helped to open up his mind to uh, values that really had been lost in Western civilization for centuries, but now under the influence of the Renaissance and the humanists were being recovered. I should mention too, and this is an important, is that he had a relative on his mother's side, a fellow by the name of Johannes Reuchlin, who was the most prominent Hebrew scholar in the Christian world at that time, and a very strong advocate of the humanism that I've just been talking about. And he took an interest in Malang education and not only recommended schools, but also encouraged him while he was going to school. And in fact, it was uh, Reuchlin who recommended that he be the Greek professor at Wittenberg when that opportunity came along. So how did, how did, you mentioned earlier, he was born into the Schwarzart family? That's right. How did, how did he end up with the name Melanchthon then? Was it because he was so popular, he just needed to have a (laughs) stage name to protect himself? That's a, that's a great question. One of the peculiarities of the humanist movement was that many of them took Greek or Latin forms of their name. It was kind of signified uh, what they were interested in and what they were good at. And apparently it was uh, Reuchlin who first called Melanchthon Melanchthon because that is the Greek equivalent of the German Schwarzerd. Schwarzerd means dark or black earth. And that's exactly what Melanchthon means in Greek is dark and Thonus is earth. So he's got the Greek equivalent of his German name, but definitely it sounds a lot classier if you're a classicist to call yourself Melanchthon instead of Schwarzerd. So that's the story. So I was right. (laughs) You were right. You were right. (laughs) That is one of, that name is just so fun to type. There's so many T's and H's. Exactly. It's easy to, it's easy to get it wrong too. I've had more than one student get it wrong. (laughs) I'll tell you a quick anecdote on this Greek name. Uh, Luther even toyed with calling himself Eleutherius put an E on the end and I use at the end of it, Luther Eleutherius, because that in Greek means a free man. And Christian freedom was so important to him that there, there's a little bit of evidence that he actually used that for himself sometimes. Ha, huh, that is so interesting. Okay, so you mentioned his uncle and recommending him to this. Yeah, and, and we're not exactly sure that it was his uncle. Okay. We, just, we just know that he was a, a relative of the family on the mother's side. Gotcha. So, so what happened with that professorship? What, how did that kind of introduce him to all of this, all of these Reformation ideas? Yeah, good, good question. The University of Wittenberg was a, a new university, and so it was open to new ideas and new programs. And part of the Reformation that occurred even before the Ninety Five Theses was kind of modernizing uh, the curriculum at uh, Wittenberg. And in these years, if you're going to do that you had to bring in experts on the biblical languages, starting with Greek, but also Hebrew. And so they were looking around for a Greek scholar. Now, by this time, Langton had his degree, bachelor's and master's, and master's equipped you for teaching. So Reuchlin was the one who recommended to Frederick the Wise, who was the ruler of Saxony and the patron of the university, that he should hire Philip Melanchthon as his Greek professor. So Melanchthon arrived in Wittenberg in 1518. It's after the Reformation has already begun, but he arrives in order to teach Greek and indeed to teach classics and to be a part of this renewal movement of Christian civilization by going back to the classics. But it didn't take him long uh, to fall under the charismatic person of Luther and to embrace the theological aspects of the Reformation as well as the cultural ones. So very early, we find uh, Melanchthon, for example, with Luther at the Leipzig debate that's in 1519, just a year after Melanchthon had arrived. 
And then uh, he's writing in defense of Luther against some of the attacks made upon him at that at that debate and afterwards. So very quickly, the young Melanchthon, and remember, he's about 13, 14 years younger than um, Luther. And, and so he's, he falls under Luther's influence and embraces the Reformation cause. And Luther becomes a friend to him and encourages Melanchthon to study theology. Melanchthon actually takes what it called it's, it's a bachelor's degree in Bible, bachelor's degree in theology at Wittenberg, and that permits him to teach Bible and to teach theology at the university. So in addition to his classical studies and the liberal arts material that he always taught and worked with, he also then begins to teach and lecture on books of the Bible. Romans was one of his specialties, and a piece of interesting trivia is the fact that Luther never published a commentary on Romans. And the reason why he didn't, well, he said Melanchthon has already done it. So kind of the Lutheran commentary from the period on Romans is Melanchthon's work rather than Luther's. We're learning about the life of Philip Melanchthon, whose birth is commemorated today by the church. We're talking with the Reverend Dr. Cameron McKenzie, the Forrest E. and Francis H. Hillis Ellis Professor of Historical Theology at Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne. We'll continue the conversation in just a moment right here on The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. At Concordia University, Wisconsin, we believe you were created for a reason, to use your God-given gifts to help others, to live a life of self-sacrifice in a me-first world, to live a life that's uncommon. Whether you're taking one of 50-plus online programs or learning with us in person on the shores of Lake Michigan, you'll be equipped to make an uncommon impact. Learn more at cuw.edu. Concordia University, Wisconsin. Live uncommon. Welcome back to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. We're learning about Philip Melanchthon, whose birth is commemorated by the church today. We're talking with Dr. Cameron McKenzie of Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana. So you shared with us a little bit about his uh, Melanchthon's connection to Luther. How did they interact? What was their, where did their paths actually cross? And what was the relationship between Luther and Melanchthon? Well, their paths crossed all the time at the university. And of course, also in Wittenberg. Wittenberg was a uh, really a small town, just a couple thousand people. So it'd be difficult not to cross cross paths with anybody in Wittenberg. And of course, they didn't. So they were both then professors, and they were both committed to a reformation of the church. Uh, each really had his uh, strengths and weaknesses. Luther was the, as I said, charismatic uh, personality. He was the center of the movement right from its beginnings. Melanchthon certainly was not a shy person, but he was, uh, his reputation is that of one of being milder and gentler. Uh, but also a very capable uh, scholar. So, for example, I talked about um, Melanchthon being with Luther at the uh, Leipzig debate. Well, after Luther was condemned as an outlaw at the Diet of Worms in 1521, Luther really could not leave Saxony without being in danger of being arrested by imperial authorities. So, for example, when the um, Lutherans and the everybody was summoned to the Diet of Augsburg in 1530, Luther could go to Coburg, which was still in Saxony, but many miles away yet was Augsburg. It was Melanchthon then who went as the theologian with the Saxon party for the Diet of Augsburg. And when at Augsburg, the Lutheran territorial rulers decided that they wanted to present just one confession of their faith to the emperor. They couldn't ask Luther to do it. They had to ask Melanchthon to do it. And so he did. So it's at Augsburg that Melanchthon is the principal author of the Augsburg Confession. 
And subsequently, at meetings like that, it will be Melanchthon who kind of leads the Lutheran delegation of theologians. So he becomes a voice and face of Lutheranism over the succeeding decades in a way that Martin Luther really can't because of his kind of legal situation and being forced to stay there in Wittenberg. Now, that doesn't mean that Melanchthon's name appears on everything and it's all Melanchthon all the time. No, Luther is still the major voice and personality, but Melanchthon does have this key role role of both describing Lutheranism in documents like the Augsburg Confession and then in representing Lutheranism at these important meetings. Mm-hmm. So what were some of the things, I know you've mentioned Romans, especially what right. were some of the things that, that Melanchthon really focused on during his time at Wittenberg and, and as the Reformation progressed? Sure. Let me mention three things. Here's, a, here's an idea for you in the fall of this year. The, Luther, the, the first part of the Luther Bible is produced, and that's in September of 1522. And it has the name Luther on it because Luther, again, was the major instigator and uh, producer of this of this translation of the uh, Greek and the Hebrew into German. So we talk about it as the Luther Bible. But Melanchthon and others were worked with Luther all the time on the production of that Bible to make sure it was good German as well as well translated. So when Luther had his first version of the German New Testament done, it was Melanchthon who checked over the translation to make sure it was done accurately. So one of Luther's lifetime projects that became also a major project in Melanchthon's career was that the production of a Bible translated from the original languages into German. So so that would be one thing. A a second project, thing that I'll mention has to do with these confessional documents. The Augsburg Confession, certainly the most important and the greatest of the confessions coming from the Lutheran confessions coming from that period, he's the principal author of that. But no sooner uh, did they submit the Augsburg Confession than the emperor ruled that it had been refuted by the Roman Catholic response, something called the confutation. Well, immediately, a Melanchthon set out to defend the Augsburg Confession from the attacks of their opponents. And that defense then was published subsequently, a year or so later, as what we call today the Apology of the Augsburg Confession. And it was often published with the Augsburg Confession. So it became a second confessional document that defines Lutheranism. And it was the work of Melanchthon to explain and to defend what the Lutherans had originally confessed in the Augsburg Confession. And then a few years after that, when the Lutherans were invited to a church council that the Pope had uh, begun, and they had to think about whether they wanted to do that, they finally decided not to attend, but they realized that their Augsburg Confession didn't include any statement of the Lutherans' beliefs on the power and the primacy of the Pope. So again, they turned to Melanchthon to write up a relatively small treatise treating the power of the Pope, also the power of the bishops. And this then became a third confessional document. It's still a part of our Book Book of Concord, and it defines what we mean to be Lutheran. So in that Book of Concord, you have 10 documents, three from the early church, the three creeds, and seven from the 16th century. Three of those seven were written by Melanchthon. And Luther also wrote three. He wrote the two catechisms and the small cult articles. So when I said before that Melanchthon was a co-founder, at least from the standpoint of the Book of Concord, you could say, yeah, he really was. But that's the, the second thing, his, his role as a confessional writer and defender of the faith. I want to mention one other of his works that is of real importance, and that is his work called the Lotzi Communes, English for commonplaces. It was something that humanists did when they were writing up a uh, kind of a textbook sort of thing about a certain branch of knowledge. They would 
right under topics that were common to the subject matter. Well, that's what Melanchthon did for Lutheran doctrine. So that work, his Lotzi Communes, his commonplaces of doctrine, his theological commonplaces, actually is the first Lutheran dogmatics. Even to this day in our Lutheran seminaries and our Lutheran colleges, we will use books of doctrine. Well, it was the Melanchthon who did the first one, and he took the topics that define Christianity in the Book of Romans, and for each of those topics, he collected the Bible passages that treat that, and then he put that into, well, in those days it would be Latin, and so they became available as a, as a way of teaching the faith. If you have all the teachings of the Bible on a certain topic in a certain place, it's easier to teach, and if you have to you know, sort through the Bible text every every time. So the foundation of Lutheran dogmatics actually goes back to Philip Melanchthon. He's the first one to write a Lutheran textbook of doctrine. And then subsequently, other theologians have done the same, but the foundation for it all goes back to... Based on Melanchthon's great involvement in the Lutheran Reformation and writing many, much of the confessions... One might assume that Philip Melanchthon was a called and ordained priest. <laughs> yeah, one might was assume he? that, <laughs> yeah. but well, one would be wrong if he assumed well, it. <laughs> right. What, what was he? Was he? A- he was not, and he was not ordained. At one point early in his career at Wittenberg, when he was studying theology and preparing himself to teach uh, Bible, Luther wanted him to go that route, but Melanchthon resisted that. He wanted to stay in the classroom, and he wanted to stay. He wanted to continue teaching those things that he had been called there to teach in the first place. And that included things like history, philosophy, literature, things kind of above and beyond theology. Uh, I, I think the best way to understand what he was would be to compare him to, say, one of, the, one of our professors at a Concordia college who teaches theology, but also might teach philosophy or might also teach literature. Today, we'd say somebody like that is called to what we would call maybe a helping office. He's not a pastor, but he has an office that the church created for the sake of helping the ministry and helping, of course, with the work of the church. So that's what Melanchthon was. He was not an ordained clergyman. Instead, he held this important office of teacher at the University of Wittenberg. He was a DCE, basically. <laughs> oh, yeah. that There we go. There we go. Had to get that in. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Yeah. We only have we only have a couple of minutes left. So kind of uh, wrapping this up, putting a, a, a nice bow on it. What what should we be familiar with today with with Melanchthon's work? If we if we want to, to read some of his things, obviously the Book of Concord. But what what are the highlights that we should really pay attention to now of his work during the Reformation? Well, there is, if you're interested, we have English translations, both his commentary on Romans and his uh, Lotzi Communes. Those would be available uh, to students. And I, I'm pretty sure that Lotzi Communes is a CPH. There are lots of editions of it. It's expanded, but I would say that would be a, a good thing, uh, a good thing to uh, start with. The other thing to do would be to actually read about more of his history we didn't have time to talk about his later interests history. That's also very fascinating. And maybe for the 550th anniversary of his birth, you can have me back and we'll talk about the second half of his career. <laughs> so much great history that we got yeah. to learn today. Dr. McKenzie, thank you so much for helping us learn about the first Lutheran DCE, Philip Melanchthon. <laughs> oh, <laughs> sorry, I just had to attribute that to him. But really, in, in all honesty, thank you so much for helping us learn about this great reformer and how the Lord used him to, to bring about the, the Reformation, the Lutheran Reformation. It's, it's just been fascinating learning all this. Thanks so much for being our guest on the Coffee Hour today. You're very welcome. I certainly enjoyed it. Thank you. You've been listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. The Coffee Hour with Andy and Sarah is a production of KFUO. To support The Coffee Hour and KFUO Radio, visit KFUO.org. You can also text KFUO to 41444 or send an email to gifts at KFUO.org. And you can call us at 800-844-0524. KFUO. Christ for you anytime, anywhere. Oh,